warning us about the importance of winter foraging by thermally dissimilar fish species. It is on, but yes. it's really quiet. Can you just hear me in the back? Up this way? Okay. So, my name is Ben Block, and this is my dissertation project talk. So, I haven't actually collected many of this data yet, but I'm trying to all convince you to go out fishing when it's cold outside. So, I hope I can make that happen in the next 15 minutes. So, I think winter is the missing piece in every ecological puzzle, but fisheries research has largely ignored that for the up until recently, and now we have quite a few conferences coming up that are focusing on this. And part of that is possibly because there's hypotheses related to low water temperatures making fish unresponsive, immobile, and in just incapable of feeding in the winter. Therefore, the leading thought is that we shouldn't study any fish in the winter because there's no reason to. Well, I want to prove that somewhat wrong. And another issue is that the logistics of just doing this is somewhat hard. You can't go take a boat out in the winter, and there's a good solid chunk of ice between you and the fish you want to catch. <clears throat> However, a few studies have actually looked at this, but they're primarily focused on high latitude lakes, mainly in Scandinavia, and a lot of those are on cold water species such as Arctic char. In addition, there's quite a few studies that have been done experimentally looking at cold water temperatures, but these pretty much lacked prey and habitat diversity that fish might encounter in the winter. So what we're wanting to look at is actually cold and or cool and warm water fishes in the winter because those are what we have identified in the literature as being not represented. So while there's plenty of questions to get answered as far as what's happening underneath the ice as far as fish goes, we'll be focusing on winter foraging and the energetic importance of that. So to get kind of a background, I want to do a preferred versus winter temperature graph for you. So preferred temperatures kind of came about in the 1970s, Magnus et al., and they segregated fish species into three different fields, cold, cool, and warm water fishes. But here you have a temperature graph of Lake Champlain, which is a, a general seasonal graph. And to get a sense of how these fish fit on here, I kind of mapped them out for you. So cold water fishes like about this temperature range here, between 12 and 18 degrees Celsius. Then you move into the cool, cool water fishes, which are like something a bit warmer, and finally warm water fishes. And altogether, these fishes occupy primarily this water temperature range here. However, the rest of the year is outside of that quote unquote temperature preference range. Therefore, how do we, how to, uh, how to manage energetic demands in the winter is a conundrum faced by every fish species, including everything that's represented in these groups, but each species corresponds to a particular winter survival strategy that should allow them to handle the winter in a different way. So the objective of our study is to determine the energetic importance of winter foraging on cool and warm water fish species. And, oh, all right, all right, nope. <laughs> you must not like that one slide. Uh, so this is a, this is a schematic that was published in Shooter et al. 2012, showing energy storage on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And essentially what I want you to look at here is this solid black line right here. And that's where the metabolic cost of energy is equal to the net energy gain of foraging. So what this means is that anything below this line is where the metabolic cost of activity, so foraging, moving around in the winter, is actually more expensive than the net energy gain that you gain from foraging in, the, in that season. Therefore, if any fish is, falls into that category, we expect that they would not feed in the winter. Conversely, anything that has a higher net energy gain in the winter compared to how much it's actually expending to feed should be on this side of that solid line and should forage in the winter. And so this came about in this paper, Shooter et al. 2012, which is a big review paper by BJ Shooter. And they essentially segregated fish species not only into temperature preferences, but different, two different winter survival strategy groups. You have winter active fish and winter inactive fish. The winter active fish, they're the ones that should be foraging in the winter and get a net energy gain from that foraging. Conversely, you have the winter inactive fish that should get actually a net energy loss from winter because they're not feeding at all. They're actually just using the energy that they gained in the fall and moving that on for the rest of the season. And how they segregated this was by thermal preferences and life history traits. 
therefore, the examples of an ap winter active fish would be a cold water or a cool water fish, while a winter inactive fish would be a warm water fish. So I think that's where I'm just leaving the, the idea so far. So you have thermal preferences leading to winter survival strategies, and you should see something along those lines. However, all right, one more. All right. Mm -hmm. However, there's no direct evidence of winter foraging or the lack thereof in the inactive case for most species of freshwater fish. And actually, when going through this review paper, I wanted to see how many studies actually went and collected fish in the winter. And so there's 48 papers included in this, in this uh, review. 16 of them were, had direct observations on cool and warm water fishes, but only one of them actually collected fish in the winter. And that was actually right outside collecting striped bass from the Hudson River. So where are all the in situ studies on winter foraging and energy use, if, and how can we prove this in a general sense? So the objective of our study is to test whether natural fish populations actually are observable in showing these winter survival strategies that have been hypothesized by the literature and discussed in the shooter paper. In addition, we'll be using winter, or we'll be collecting energy use data, uh, data to look at the seasonal variation in energy use of cool and warm water species. Finally, the winter diet data and the energy use data will be then input into a bioenergetics model to inform whether winter foraging is important for the annual growth of freshwater fish species. So at this point, you're probably wondering how the methods will work. And so we'll be doing our work on Lake Champlain, which separates Vermont from New York. Specifically, I'll be looking at this little bay right here, which is called Keeler Bay. Um, I'm studying this little bay just because I'm not looking at the overall population of my study species in Lake Champlain, but rather I'm wanting to look at a seasonal variation in how they're using their energy and whether winter is important. So by now you're probably wondering how we're going to collect fish from under the ice. And we'll be doing it two ways. We'll be sending gill nets as well as using standard, standard sampling techniques such as ice angling. Um, I can get into further detail of how I'm actually going to set gill nets under the ice, but if you have any questions, you can ask me about that. Um, for the rest of the seasons, during the open water season, we'll be using a variety of techniques to catch our study species. Oh. All right. So we'll be using three study species, yellow perch, pumpkin seed, and bluegills. <clears throat> so a yellow perch, which is a cool water fish, would be hypothesized then to belong to that winter active group, hypothesized by Shooter at all. The sunfishes, on the other hand, are warm water fishes. And since they're warm water fish, they should belong to that winter inactive group. Therefore, the yellow perch, we should see them actually foraging in the winter and getting a net energy gain from that foraging. Meanwhile, the sunfishes should cease foraging at the end of the fall and only decrease in their energy use throughout until ISO. So how are we going to get at the energetics of winter? First, we'll be doing stomach content analysis, and that'll be looking at the seasonal variation in prey composition, as well as the diversity in what's being consumed. In addition, we'll be looking at the proportion of empty stomachs to see whether there's a, a time of year that's more that's a, having more feeding than other times of year. In addition, we'll be doing total lipid determination to see the seasonal variation in lipid content throughout the year. So, this is a conceptual model that I created for a generic spring spawner. So you have total lipids on the y-axis and month on the x-axis. And so right here is the low point where you'd expect spawning to occur. And the black line essentially represents a yearly trend in total lipids, where after a fall peak, you'd have a decrease, a decrease in the fall into the winter, and that continues in the winter until ice out again in the spring. So this would be representative of no winter foraging. However, if you would see winter foraging, you expect that, that total lipid content to be higher, if not maintained. So then you can get to the prediction of saying, if, if total lipids are increasing or are maintained in winter, you would then expect winter foraging to be important. This is simply because to get a curve that would go down, you can't be gaining energy at any point. But any gain of energy would either maintain that harking back to that schematic that I showed you, or it actually be increasing in the winter. 
Finally, we'll be putting this into a bioenergetics model to assess annual growth. So specifically, we'll be using the FISH bioenergetics 4 model that came out recently. The bioenergetics model will include winter data. So this will be winter diet data, winter prey energy densities, as well as the energy density of our predators. And this will allow us to assess whether winter foraging is actually important for the annual growth of all of our fish species. In addition, we'll be doing bioenergetics model in relation to climate change. And this is just a side project that I'm really interested in because, so for example, here we have a increase and this is like a standard temperature curve for a given year. And then the orange would represent the growth of an individual fish throughout a year. Now this is at an average temperature, a generic average temperature speed. But what we can do with the model is actually just increase it two degrees Celsius which re is represented by the dotted line in blue. So every month is warmer by two degrees Celsius. And we can observe whether fish growth increases or decreases throughout the year. And don't worry too much about whether this is accurate or not. It's more representing that we can manipulate the model in various ways to test climate change predictions and assess whether that climate change would actually have an effect on individual growth as well as population growth. So in summary, there are two winter survival strategies that have been hypothesized by the literature, and those are the winter active fish and the winter inactive fish. We've identified that cool and warm water species are not represented in the literature for win as far as winter foraging goes. We'll be using diets and comparing them within winters and among seasons to get a holistic view of what fish are feeding on throughout the entire year. And we'll combine that with total lipids to assess when energy is being gained and consumed. Finally, those two will then be added into a bioenergetics model to assess annual growth of individuals. And the bioenergetics model will also allow you to test whether annual growth will be affected by climate change. So in summary, we are going to provide novel insights into a time of year that's been largely ignored until recently by fisheries biologists. And this information can give us a sense of whether winter has a significant impact on the annual growth of individuals. And when you consider that climate change is imminent by multiple uh, talks that were given the past couple of days, we can really assess whether or not a decreased winter duration and decreased severity will actually negatively or positively impact individual growth and population growth in fish species. So therefore, just having a baseline of what's going on in the winter is urgently needed before we can do any further work as to assess what what's occurring in climate change. And so before I let you go, I would like to leave you with a question to chew on. And that is, what additional information could you obtain if you were to collect fish in the winter in addition to your normal sampling review? And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the Rubenstein Ecosystem Science Lab, which is our lab at UVM. I'd also like to thank the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission for my funding, as well as the Explorers Club for their research funding. And finally, all of you for awarding me the Clum Spindler Award to get here today. And with that, I thank you, and I'll take any questions.